Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Fishersgate Community Lighthouse. I hope you're well. Um, we're going to be sharing God's Word this morning, sharing in worship. And the theme uh, to this morning is the goodness of God. So I would really encourage you to get your Bibles ready. Um, Kathy is going to come up and give us a story about um, David and Goliath. But before we start, let's commit the service uh, to God this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that we can be joined together through technology. And I just pray that you'll be with us this morning, wherever we are, Lord, that you'll fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first Bible study is going to be, or Bible reading, is Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. Good morning. This morning I want to share with you about the story of David and Goliath. I, mean, I know many of you will know it. I heard it many years ago in Sunday school. But I've just read it again as I'm working my way through some books from the Old Testament. David, who was a shepherd boy, was the youngest of eight brothers. Three of his elder brothers had gone to fight in the Israeli army against the Philistines. One day, his father, Jesse, said to David, take some provisions for, you, for your brothers and see how they are. When David arrived, his brothers weren't pleased to see him as he was asking questions. And Goliath, this giant of the Philistines, had just started taunting the Israeli army again. He had come before the armies of Israel for 40 days. Goliath was over nine feet tall, and he said, Send me a man who will fight me, and if he defeats me, we shall be your slaves. But if I defeat you, you will be our slaves. The soldiers were dismayed and terrified. Someone had reported to Saul that David was asking questions, so he sent for him. David said to Saul, I will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said, you are too young. How can you defeat such a man who has been in the army many years? David said, I've been tending my father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came to attack the sheep, I have run after it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And if it turned on me, I then killed it. Saul agreed that David could go against Goliath, but he wanted him to wear his armour. He put it on him. But David said, I can't wear this. I am not used to it. It will only hinder me. So David took off the armour and went to face Goliath. He took with him his slingshot and picked five stones. As he approached Goliath, David said, You come against me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down. As the Philistine moved closer, David ran quickly toward the battle line and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck Goliath on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground and David killed him and all the Philistines fled. David knew that it was only with God's help that he had been able to do that. Now this David who slew Goliath is the same David who wrote many Psalms the most well-known being Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. David, having been a shepherd and cared for his sheep, knew how God cared for him. And as we see in his battle with Goliath, David trusted God. As we go through life, we have different Goliath's problems to face. It doesn't matter how big or small. When we trust in God, he will help us. 
Throughout the Bible, we are told many times of God's love for us. In John 3, verses 16 and 17, we are told, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In Romans 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another verse, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, tells us, Cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Philippians 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Throughout the Old and New Testament, God's people have been encouraged to pray, and to praise God. Many of the Psalms are praising God. I've learned over the years to sing praises to God when I'm feeling down. We are told to put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It truly lifts you up as you look to the Lord, reminding ourselves that all he has done for us and who he is, almighty God. Also in Philippians 4 verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When we look on these things, our problems don't seem as big. I love, love hymns that remind me of God's love. I remember one from my school days. God is love, he's the care, tending each everywhere. God is love, all is there. Jesus came to show him that mankind might know him. Other favourites I have is what a friend we have in Jesus. Count your blessings. If we count our blessings, we've got other things to look at. And all the way my Saviour leads me. At the moment I keep singing, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. So as I finish, I do with pray we will be like David, trusting God in every situation we're in, whatever we find ourselves in. Even through all these problems with the pandemic, Lord, we can thank you that we can trust you. So let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for your great love for us. That love that sent your son into the world to take upon himself all our sicknesses and sins so we have access to you, the Father. We just praise you for all our many blessings, for all our friends and family, trusting you will keep them safe through this pandemic. I'll just take a moment to lift up those we know and love in need of a touch from you. So if you'd like to lift up your loved ones to the Lord in prayer, And we just thank you, Lord, that you do hear all those prayers of ours, the ones that are said and just the ones in our minds and our hearts. And we do thank you that you know their needs. We also lift up our government to you. Pray you will give them all wisdom at this time to know the way forward. We thank you for our National Health Service and all those working so hard to tend those in need. Pray you'll keep them safe. We do just pray for the way forward concerning the vaccinations and that they will be available to to who needs them, whatever their circumstances. We do just thank you for your words that reminds us to cast all our cares on you. So we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. That was an amazing story. Um, God is good to us.
we've got a Bible reading. Um, it's Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 to 31. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground. Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. That's the sixth day. God's creation, uh, God created the earth, and his creation was good. Um, you're always a bit brave talking about creation, because certainly we've all been in situations that we've, when we've had discussions about creation, everyone suddenly becomes a scientist. Everyone suddenly becomes a quantum physicist and tries to explain how God created it. You sort of hear protons, atoms, you hear evolution, you hear monkeys, fish, dogs, all sorts. We have, we have this sense of needing to know everything. We need to know how we were made. We need to know how the earth was formed. Um... I woke up at four o'clock this morning and I, was, I couldn't get off to sleep. So I, very silly, very silly, but I went on YouTube and I saw a debate about creation. It was held in an American church. You had three, uh, let's get their titles right, there were three atheist, creationist, scientists, three of them. And then on the other side, you had three uh, Christian uh, create, um, creationist uh, apologists, and then you had some evolutionists. So you had a massive pa panel. They were discussing and arguing and debating about creation. And it made me nervous. They were going on. All these academics were going on about creation for two and a half hours. Now, I didn't watch it. Oh, well, I did. I watched five minutes of it. Then I played my game, and then I watched the end. And I, I watched a bit in the middle. I saw the start, middle, and finish. And I am none of the wiser of what they concluded. But then I read the Bible. God tells us what we need to know. It's a bit like a car. I know that my car is going to get me to A to B, hopefully. Well, unless you've got a Peugeot. But predominantly, you can get to A to B with a car. You know how to drive it. You know how to drive it safely. You know how to move the car. You don't necessarily need to know the dynamics and the, uh, the physics behind it. So God is really clear on the first chapter of creation. In fact, the very first chapter, we see God's character. We see God's goodness. We see that he has this ability to create something that is good. And in fact, before man was even put on earth, God mentions the word good six times. He's made something. He's made the birds and the bees. He's made seed. He produces the rain. He gives us everything that we need. And all we need to know is that his creation is good. All we need to know 
is that we need to live in harmony with each other and with God. We need to reflect this, good, this goodness and not get tied down to all the... Um, th there are some things in life, dare I say, that we don't need to know. Okay, and the creation fear in the Bible tells us about God's goodness. He's created us. He's a creator. He, he's, he loves us. He, he, want, he wants to be in a relationship with us. But I, what I really like is that he doesn't want to keep us in this box. He wants us to have the free will. He wants us to enjoy his goodness. And he's, and he's given this, this freedom. Um, this debate that I listened to this morning, one of the arguments, I'm not going to get too much into it because I haven't got that long. One of the arguments, was that the, one of the atheists did say that we're controlled as Christians. Well, I read the first three chapters of Genesis, and all I can see is that God loves us. He's created this beautiful planet for us to enjoy. He wants us to, he wants us to be stewards for his creation. He wants us to look after it. And it's not just his creation. He wants us to look after each other. And he wants to be, still be part of that. So we've got this, this, like, this unity, this circle of unity um, for us to enjoy. So the creation story, what is it? It is God, character of goodness, of kindness, God's character to give us the free will. God's ca good character to make us live in harmony. And he's always thinking about us. We see further along Genesis that God sees that we need a companion and he gives us a companion. He gives us guidance good guidance. But we messed up. But it's God's creation. And God is continuously a part of this creation. He's given us salvation. When we choose to do wrong things or when we choose to go down a different path that is away from God when we choose a path where we don't get on with each other and when we disrespect the world that we live in and move away from God God has a plan for that And this plan is to bring us back to his good creation. Um, I was walking the dog this morning and I listened to, it's quite ironic actually, I listened to BBC Radio 4, so I'm getting older now and we appreciate it more. I think as you get older, there's a couple of things that change. You start wearing glasses, you start reading the Bible that says large print and you listen to BBC Radio 4. Radio 4 was actually talking about creation. About our responsibilities that we have. And about the goodness on creation. Now, I was pleased about this. I would have written down what they were saying. But I didn't have a pen and I was driving. But the good thing about it is that what I read in the book is what they were relaying. God's goodness is everywhere. And what I would encourage people today, and I, you know, I, I would do it after this service, just go out and see God's creation. Just see how perfect it is. I always remember I broke down on a motorway. And when you break down on the motorway, you know what you've got to do? You've got to get out of your car. And it was in Kent, 
And I got out, and the, you've got the M20, and you've got cars going by, hooting, aggression. Uh, it, was, it was rush hour. Um, I was going down to Dover, and it was busy. Now, most motorways, as we know in this country, have got a field next to it. Majority of motorways have got green, it's got places of rest. Because we don't, it's kind of like how we live our lives. You would very rarely go, on, go and see what's on a motorway. And if you do, you, you may get told off. But I always remember I came away from the motorway and sat on the field. And, and just the awe of creation. Peaceful. Beauty. Not rushing. Like most of us, I, I'm, I'm blessed to, to appreciate that. This morning, walking the dog, the sea, the peacefulness, the perfect creation. God's created something that we can enjoy. And there's so much to God. There's so much more to God that if we just stay close with God and we, we pray, we have fellowship with each other, that we can see this goodness. There was a film called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. It was a great 1980s film. And you would... Um, Basically, the father was a mad scientist. He built this machine that made the, his children smaller, made shrink into the size of an ant. And then the children had a journey from, ended up getting in the rubbish, and they had to go from the front of the house back to the house. And the reason why I'm telling this story is that when we see grass, we, we just, we don't see what's, when we see God's love, bear with me on this, when we see God's love, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, so this, you know, the honey I shrunk the kids, you know, they went through the grass and it was like this a whole ray of a new life. It was that they entered into this new life that they would never have seen. And it's a bit like God. You can enter into God's, um, this, this whole new life of goodness with God. Seek and you shall find. Seek God out and you will find him. So that didn't take too long. It didn't take two and a half hours. The moral of the story is that in God's creation, there's goodness. When he created us, created the earth, it was out of goodness. And we can all receive that goodness. Seek and you shall find. So I'm sorry if I didn't mention any atoms or protons. I didn't explain to you how we came about with matter. But more importantly, we see the very first chapter in the Bible. We see God's goodness. And that is the most important thing. The reading is taken from James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. Faith and deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous 
for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We do just pray for Matt as he comes to talk about this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, thank you, Kathy. I love James. It's, it's a great book. Oh, I am on, sorry. Um, it's a great book. And we see uh, chapter, chapter 2. James is educating Christians. James is educating um, Jewish Christians. And he's telling us how we should live. And I think it's great. We're not told, God doesn't tell us to do something that we can't do. God tells us to do things that reflect his goodness. That's the instruction. And it's plain and simple. It, it's not, we don't need, de I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a biblical scholar, I'm not a scientist. Um, but I understand this. This is reflecting God's goodness. We're not asked to become surgeons. We're not asked to become, you know, the, 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 these, uh, the prime minister. We're asked to be good to each other the same way God has shown his goodness to us. And what James goes on to say is that this goodness, we've received God's goodness in ourselves. And when you truly, this is the key thing, when you truly and genuinely have accepted Jesus into your life, and you have faith, and you believe in what the Bible teaches us, it becomes second nature to do what is good. Because you've received that goodness already and you want to mirror that goodness. So we need to mirror that goodness for each other. In a selfishness way. In a genuine, humble way. So what James is saying is faith and works. They come hand in hand. If you have, and it's, it's plain and simple, in this chapter, if you have faith and don't do works, you haven't got faith. And I was trying to think of a, a way of, of kind of explaining it, and I was thinking about a sailing boat. A sailing boat needs a kill. If it doesn't have a kill, and it's got massive sails, it sinks. If a sailing boat doesn't have sails and got a big keel, it doesn't go anywhere. A sailing boat needs a keel and a sail. They come hand in hand, like faith and works and good deeds. I was told of an example the other week. Um, it's a bit like if you get someone knock at your door. It's a strange example, but and they they have no clothes, they have no food, and if you tell them to go, tell them go and get some food, go and get some clothes on, and slam the door in their face. That's not doing good deeds. We're told to do good, to do good deeds. We're told to clothe people, to feed people, to look after people. And it's, we all do it. 
And what James is also saying is that it doesn't matter what the it doesn't matter what deed that we're doing. It doesn't matter if we give that you know if we give that person if we help someone out and but secretly we're thinking oh yeah but what they're going to do or are they going to benefit that's not our business. Our business is to give do good deeds. The same way that God has given us goodness. God has sown a seed for us and we need to sow that seed. Good deeds and faith come hand in hand. God has shown us goodness and we need to reflect that goodness for each other. Especially in a time of lockdown. You don't have to do huge things. You don't have to go and get loans out and you know, give people thousands of pounds. A good deed is phoning someone. A good de- in a time of lockdown, a good deed is praying for each other. Phoning people, communicating. Write a letter. When I was a kid, after Christmas, I'd have to write loads of letters to your auntie, didn't you? You know, they'll, they'll give you five pounds. I'd write them a letter. And that's, that's a good deed. Do you know why it's a good deed? Because it makes that person feel good. So I want to give you an example now. We, I want to turn to, um, if we can, turn to Acts. Chapter... 16, verse 16 to 40. Now, just follow along with me. I'm just going to tell you a little story about um, Saul. We'll start with his name, Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus. We all know the story of St. Paul. He had this conversion. St. Paul, well, at the time his name was Saul, his job was to go and hunt out Christians. His job was to get rid of all Christians. His job was to persecute Christians. On one of his assignments, Saul was on the road to Damascus and he had an encounter with Jesus. And this encounter with Jesus made Saul completely change his life around. He saw things completely different. And he completely converted from being a hard Jewish person that that was just going around, destroying, getting rid of Christians, to becoming St. Paul, who was one of the first greatest missionaries of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want to pinpoint this story here. Um, Him and uh, Paul and Silas uh, were in Philippi. And he was, so Paul now is preaching and he's preaching the good news. As he's preaching the good news, he has this, um, he has an encounter with, um, a young girl that was a fortune teller. But this girl knew that, G- that Paul was there telling about the God of Israel. Uh, this girl then um, changed her ways and stopped being a fortune teller. Uh, because of this, It caused a lot of unrest within the communities. The authorities were worried about Paul and Silas because they were, you you know, they were they were changing things. They were bringing goodness back into the community. They were put in prison. So Paul and Silas were put in prison. Now, bearing in mind, they were before they were put in prison, they were stripped naked. They were beaten. And they were flogged. Then the jailer put them in the inner 
part of the prison in their cell. They had their feet shackled up. Now, we just need to picture that. That must have been awful. Now, this is where the goodness of God comes. Because at midnight, Paul and Silas were worshipping. They were singing praise to God. They had joy. And the other uh, prisoners heard this and were baffled by it. Now, apparently the jailer didn't because the jailer was asleep. Then suddenly there was an earthquake. Split the jail up and the doors opened out. They could have escaped. Paul and Silas and the other prisoners could have escaped. The jailer woke up, woke up and the jailer was going to kill himself. He got his sword out because he's thinking, oh no, they've obviously escaped. And Paul shouted to the jailer, don't kill yourself. We're still here. Paul received the goodness from God. He must have done. He was singing in a prison. He was worshipping God. Paul done a good deed. He could have escaped. You didn't have a tracking system then. You didn't have GPS in those days. He could have just run off. He could have escaped, but that was the wrong thing to do. And he stayed. He reciprocated. He, he reflected God's goodness. And look what the knock-on effect was to this story, is that the jailer saw God. The jailer and his wanted to be saved, and he wanted his family to be saved. He then invited Paul and Silas back to the house. The jailer got uh, baptized, and so did the family. The jailer gave Paul and Silas a meal, washed, their, washed his feet. We have this circle of goodness. Last week, Paul showed a video about kindness, about an act of kindness can um, sort of like a, a ref it, it can have a dominoes effect. What I mean that if you give one act of kindness and someone else gives an act of kindness. Now, this story is very similar to that. But it all stemmed from God's goodness. Paul reflected that, and so did the jailer. And that, that's a great story of God's goodness. How God's goodness should be shared with each other. And how Jesus completely can change your life around. That Jesus' goodness can um, complete, no matter where you are or what you're doing or what you've done, I mean, if you look at Paul, he was mass killing Christians and torturing Christians, but God was able to work in Paul's life. And Paul um, became one of the great missionaries of his time. So it's something for us to reflect on. We've 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 used three stories this morning about God's goodness. And God's goodness is open to us all. And if we, and if we see God's goodness, it, we need to reflect God's goodness. And if we look at creation, it's that there's a plan for us. So as Christians, as what Paul did, he asked Jesus into his life. Paul changed his sinful ways. Well, in Paul's case, his murderous ways. And accepted the goodness of Christ into his life. So we've uh, come to the end of our service. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, but now I'd just like to encourage people to Really think of what we've been saying about the fruits of the Spirit. Paul's going to continue the series 
um, next week. God is good, and we can receive that goodness. By asking Jesus into your life, you will know that goodness. And it's uh, being a Christian, asking Jesus into your life, it's, it's a journey. Um, for me, I, I've been a Christian since 13. Um, I've had ups and downs, and all, like most of us. Uh, but I made that commitment to ask Jesus into my life. And, and the more you're close with God, the more you read the Bible. I mean, look at the smile on my face. You, get, you just feel the presence of God. So this morning as our closing prayer, if you're interested, if you want to know this goodness that God has for you, join me in this prayer. And if you say this prayer with me, we want to we hear about it. We want you to get in contact um, with Paul here or, or myself and we want to share this Christian journey if you accept Jesus into your life. So I ask now that you just, we just bow our heads. I'm just going to say our closing prayer. And if you want to know good, um, God's goodness, then say this prayer with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have created us. And thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, please forgive me for my wrong choices, my badness. Lord, I just pray that you will come into my life. You will change me. That I can have an active relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. And I just pray that you will come into my life. I ask the Holy Spirit come into my life. And change my heart. So I can see the goodness of the cross. ask for this relationship with you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you want to find out more uh, and you want to know more about God's goodness, please get in contact with us. Please phone us. We've got Facebook. We've got some great stuff. Um, so I just pray that you have a blessed week and a good week.